Uh, cool, so I'm here today to talk to you about gophers, whales, and clouds, and hopefully some things that I played around with and maybe improved my efficiency a little bit. So first of all, my name's Glenn, or Dev Alias. You might have seen me on Twitter spamming out everybody else's talks today. Um, I'm a penetration tester at TSS and also a polyglot developer, and I get up to a couple of other things when I'm not using computers including drinking butter in my coffee. So I wanted to start off by talking about a few trends and buzzwords that I've noticed across the industry and in random blog posts that I read. Now, I was gonna go into lots of stats and why you should care about these things and that kind of stuff, but if you really want that, it's already on the internet. So instead, I'm gonna talk to you about just a couple of things that caught my interest and I wanted to play around with more. So first up, Docker. Now, if you haven't heard of this before, you've probably been living under a rock, but it's a lightweight container virtualization system. So it doesn't have the same kind of isolation that you get from VMs, but it also uses far less resources on your system to run it. It does share the kernel with your computer, so if you get owned in the container, then you're probably gonna get owned anyway. But for my uses, that's not so important. Um, it takes a base operating system image, and if you use something like Alpine, that could be as small as five megabytes, and then each program you install adds a new layer on top, which can be shared among all your containers. So it really does that kind of efficiency thing that I like. So the DevOps type people use it for having kind of their build systems all wrapped up nicely, sharing, um, like clustering their data in production and keeping environments the same throughout their builds so that the software they build actually runs. For me, it's more about having my toolkit available in a way that any box I run it on, I just know it's there and it can clean up after itself when I'm done. So not cluttering it up with any dependencies or things like that. The next thing that I kind of like the idea of and seems to be pretty popular these days is serverless and functions as a service. So if you haven't heard about it before, serverless is kind of like this concept of throw it up in the cloud and make it somebody else's problem taken to the extreme. So the first thing is it's really cheap. Um, a couple of fractions of a cent to run a function on this and if you're not actually running code on it at the time, you're not paying while it sits there idle. If you want it to scale out, you just hit it with more workloads and magic happens and your service stays online. At least so goes the theory. So functions as a service is one of these serverless design patterns where you sort of take a traditional monolithic application, break it down into a series of microservices and then pull out all the functions that you'd use to build them and make them their own thing. And what this allows you to do is you get these tiny bits of code that are really easy to understand and modular, and you can kind of update them without hopefully breaking the other areas of your application. So you may have heard of some of these serverless things before. Amazon's got Lambda, Google's got their cloud functions, Azure also has cloud functions because they're not Amazon and they actually know how to name things. And this is a chart that came from a blog I was reading earlier in the year, and it just shows a pile of different things that are happening in this function as a service space. So there's quite a lot going on at the moment. The next thing that I really like the idea of is Golang, and it's not just because they have probably the cutest logo, though that is part of it. So this is a programming language that came out of Google in around 2009, and it's kind of got a bit of a C-esque feel to it, but without all of those annoying things like pointer arithmetic or managing my own memory or any of that stuff that just has no place in 2017. So it's compiled, it runs cross-platform, which is really nice, static typing because those dynamic runtimes are just, give me some typing on my variables, please. Um, memory safe, and it's really good at concurrency, so none of this playing around with managing all your threads and locking, it just kind of works. Unfortunately, it's not a functional programming language, so I do have a bit of love in my heart for Scala, but unlike Scala, it doesn't have a heavyweight interpreter run that it needs to run on, so that's pretty good. It's growing fast, there's a lot of library support out there, and most of all, it's kind of fun. 
so where this all started, um, I was hanging out back at Canberra in Australia and talking to a friend, and he sort of convinced me that I should come and do a talk at a local meetup. So I was sitting there playing around with ideas and kind of just said, yeah, all right, let's do it. So I wanted to know, like, what could I spend my time on that people might be interested in hearing about? And I started off with a tool that I was already kind of familiar with, but takes a bit too long to run, in my opinion. So if you haven't heard of it, GoBuster is a directory and DNS brute forcing tool and basically just allows you to take giant word lists and just smash them up against things really quickly. But if you've got a huge word list, then it's probably gonna take a while. So I thought, why don't we take this and run it in Lambda? Um, we get that fun serverless aspect and maybe we could divide up that word list and kind of run it in parallel or something like that. So Lambda natively doesn't support Go, which is kind of annoying, but um, you can use one of their supported languages to wrap around it and just run the binary directly. So you can make it work. Um, hopefully they'll support it at some point, but in the meantime, there's a lot of projects out there that can help it. One of those projects is Apex, and it's kind of just a little command line tool that allows you to easily compile, deploy, and then invoke these Lambda functions. And it's supported Go. So the plan was basically, dough busting is too slow, so we'll cut up the word list, send it up to the cloud, run it in parallel, some kind of black magic happens here, I'm not too sure, and then hopefully I profit and get to hack all those things I found. Now, I played around quite a while and I realized all of these things don't translate very well into slide decks. So there was a lot of time spent hacking on code and reading about too many things. I got trapped in some rabbit holes and went off on tangents that were completely unrelated, although pretty interesting. And thankfully, it seems like I didn't violate any terms of service because last time I checked, my account was still active. So at the end of all this, I had some code that was running on Lambda, seemed to do the dough busting thing, and it was kind of all tied together with some hacky bash scripts. So at this point, I should probably pray to the demo gods, but I forgot to do that this morning. So here's a little video showing just how boring it can be to watch some lines of text scroll on a screen. <laughs> now, you'll see there it cut up a word list into about 50 different chunks, and this is getting all of the brute forcing back from the Lambda invocation. So that ran through in about seven, eight seconds there. Now, that wasn't very interesting to look at, I thought I'd build a chart instead, because what's a presentation without a chart? And while you probably can't read all of the numbers on the screen there, the main thing to see in the middle there is that running on about 100 threads in GoBuster seemed to be the best performance, and those three middle bars there were kind of splitting a word list into between 20 and 100 lambda slices. And it ran, at best, in about 4.8 seconds for those 20,000 words. So what I learned from that, um, splitting things up and running them in parallel makes them go fast. Who knew? Um, about 50 lambda slices with 100 threads was the optimal out of the test that I ran, and that was in about 4.8 seconds, though there wasn't a lot of difference between 20 and 100 slices uh, running on lambda. The next thing I found was Lambda is actually really cheap. So I calculated it out, and maybe about a dollar will give you five and a half days of compute time. Um, the total cost for all of the testing I did was about five cents, and that was for 17,000 odd invocations running for about six hours of compute time. So it works out pretty well, particularly when you're on the kind of money that pen testers make. Um, <laughs> So one thing I found really annoying that I would do better next time is don't manually collect all your timing data and play with it in Excel. It's just a real pain and it takes a long time and that's not a good use of your time. Um, there is a GitHub link there with some code on it and I'll tweet out this slide deck afterwards. So if you wanna play around with it yourself, it's online. Um, so after I ran GoBuster on it, I was wondering 
what else could I kind of apply this concept to? And I was thinking like things that take a long time and just aren't really that fun. So maybe like Nmap UDP scans or scanning subnets, running those basic checks or taking screenshots of all those websites that you find out there. And I have no idea if this is work, would work because I've never done fuzzing, but if you can fit it in that 300 second window that Lambda gives you, maybe you could run fuzzing payloads across it. Um, there's heaps of cool stuff you could probably do, but the Lambda environment invocations might kind of get in your way. So there's a 300 second limit and it's kind of just hard to get access to all of the things to debug while you're running it. So I started looking into other things that Amazon provides, and of course I came across their basic cloud server offering, EC2, and auto-scaling groups. So this gives you a server in the cloud, and you can spin up multiple copies of it, and yeah, it just seems to work. Um, now to get that Lambda feel to it, the auto-scaling didn't really operate as quick as I would have liked, so there was a few minutes lag time in spinning things up and tearing them down. And, well, I wanted to install Docker on it and run things in containers anyway, and that was more set up as well. So I looked a bit deeper, and it seems I've got something that already builds that. So ECS is their container service, and it basically adds that kind of Docker layer on top of the auto-scaling servers. Now, this was nice, but what Lambda lets you do is just feed in events and get the data back out the other side. And while I could build something myself, like, who has time for that? So looking a bit deeper, I came across their batch service, which lets you define a job type, in this case, go busing, and then connect a queue to it and just kind of feed the data in and feed it out. Now, that runs on ECS, which runs on EC2 and auto-scaling, so it seems like they've got that abstraction of all their services figured out, and I probably wouldn't have to do that much to make it work. Now, I played around with it a bit, but I didn't go too deeply down that path for this time. But I did learn that basically if you need something, uh, Amazon's probably already built it before you got there, so go kind of read through the billion services they release every two days. Um, Another area I found while kind of thinking how can I get away from those Lambda restrictions is this project called OpenFaz, or Open Functions as a Service. So it came out around the end of 2016, and it's just been like growing super fast. Like they're pushing releases every day, and new features are coming out. And it's kind of just really exciting. So it allows you to run those functions as a service, kind of like Lambda, but on whatever hardware you want, um, and it leverages Docker containers to do so. So it kind of already had some of the things I wanted to play with. It comes with a command line tool, and essentially you can define a little bit of configuration about how your function should look and what container it should run. Run build, deploy, and then you can invoke it just like Lambda. Um, another nice thing with the command line tool is you can actually pipe the data in and out of it, and so you can run this function almost like it was a binary on your system. Um, so to go from a Docker container to an open FAS function, there's only like four extra lines of code you have <coughs> to add to a Docker file. Uh, that's basically referencing your image adding the little watchdog binary, which is what will accept the events that you're sending in, tell it what it should run when it gets an event, and then tell the container, start the watchdog when I start. So it's pretty quick to get going. Um, so I was looking at other kind of offensive ways that I could use Docker and what kind of tooling's already out there that I don't have to build. And I guess the first level is just taking existing tools or operating systems that you use and wrapping them up in a container. So that would be things like Kali Linux, who's put out Docker containers for their things, or just common tools that you use day to day. So there's GoBuster, Nmap, maybe Beef for Empire, and basically any tool you've got, if you Google for it, it's probably out there. The next level of kind of using Docker in an offensive way that I saw was some projects that are taking these individual tools and kind of running them together. 
So brute subs is a project that does subdomain brute forcing with a number of the common tools like GoBuster, RecommNG, AltDNS, et cetera, and kind of combines the output from all of those together to give you a richer data set of information. So that's a kind of cool way to go about it from just this old run one tool, look at results. Now, the next way I saw, and this is kind of going even more into that software engineering space, is actually turning these tools into more of a tool as a service system. So Kubebot is a Slack bot that is running on top of some Kubernetes orchestration, which is basically clustering for Docker containers and similar things. And what it lets you do is run a command like go and map this thing. It'll queue it in the background, run the tool in the cloud, gather those results, store them in Git, and then return the differential results to you. And you just hang out in Slack and drink coffee while this goes on. So that's pretty cool. Um, because there's so many things out there, like Docker containers for everything, and any tool you look at, there's probably like 100 different containers. There's sort of a couple of rules that I use for myself to figure out which ones are worth looking at or using, or if I should go build it myself. So firstly, if it's the official container for the project, it's probably a good place to start, because hopefully they'll maintain their own stuff. Hopefully. Um, next up, how many times has it been starred, and how many people download it? Because if it's popular, then maybe it's probably OK. Um, a big one for me is whether the Docker file is available. So this is basically like, do I have source code? Can I build it myself? Can I see what they've built into it? And what should or shouldn't be there? And if you need to kind of take it and build your own version, this is really nice because you can just modify what someone else has done, tweak it to update or whatever. Now, automated builds let you link the Docker build to a GitHub repo, and so whenever you push new source, the images get updated. So if, if, if I find something like that, it means it's probably more likely to be up to date, which is good. When it was last updated, kind of self-explanatory. And finally, how big the image is. So at least in the early days, but even now, there's quite a lot of Docker images out there that are just like hundreds and hundreds of megs or gigs for a tool that should only be maybe like 10 or 20 meg. And there's just all this extra bloat that doesn't need to be there. So I try and look for things built on Alpine if I can help it, or just the smallest size available that fits my other criteria. And while I was looking into how I could get really small containers, I came across a couple of tricks how you can use Golang and some features of Docker to get some really tiny containers. So first up, Golang allows static compilation, so we can get a single binary without any dependencies. And by passing a few extra flags, we can remove some redundant debug tables that don't really need to be there when we're running it. Next up, I would take UPX, which is an executable packer and allows you to make them smaller but still run basically the same when you run the tool. And then we leverage Docker's multi-build stage. And what this allows us to do is define essentially a different environment for all of the compilation of the tool and the packing. And then we just copy that compiled binary out at the end into an empty container. And so I did this with GoBuster, um, and I ended up with about a one megabyte container all up that you can just run. So it seemed to work out pretty cool. Another cool thing that I found with Golang is there's this project called Cobra, which allows you to build sort of really nice command line interfaces. And this is used by a lot of projects out there, like some of the Docker um, core libraries use it, and really just heaps, because it's nice to use. Um, one of the things I find delays me a lot when I'm starting a project is I want it to be pretty, and I want to have just the right tools in place before I start, and then weeks have gone past while I research all the tools, and then it's time for B-sides, and I haven't written any code, and yeah, so Cobra's nice. Um, you can basically just clone down the program and build it with Go, and then you just in it a new project, go into that folder, add some subcommands, and run it. And you've got a command line that looks 
almost as nice as Docker's. I don't know if you can read that very well up there, but yeah, that took about three seconds of command to generate. Now, Go for Blazor was this cool idea I had to kind of get rid of all my shell scripts and hacky tools here and there, kind of wrap up a lot of the Docker run commands and just make my life easier. If I don't have to think about it and it just works, then that's good for me and I can get on to doing the fun thing like working out how to break that really crazy cross-site scripting payload and make it run. Um, so I wanted to add in connectors that would run Docker or Lambdas, maybe open FAS functions, and just have it all from this single tool. Now currently, don't really have very much there because starting projects is hard. I did get the name done though, so I've solved one of software engineering's problems. Um, followed a lot of rabbit holes, got a couple of proof of concepts working, and that's kind of where it's at at the moment. So there is a repo, it's only got the proof of concepts, but I'm hoping that sort of over Christmas, maybe I'll have some time to hack on this a bit more. And yeah. So future directions, um, actually work on that tool. I wanna explore more tools um, that I use day to day and kind of getting them running in containers in a nice and simple way. And then going one step further and figuring out what are the manual steps I do with the output from these tools and how can I automate them and kind of build it into a workflow where I have to do less of the boring mundane stuff. Um, just reading more about Docker as well and ways I could use or abuse it. So this one project I came across called Sonom, um, it's one of these cryptocurrency ICOs that have raised way too much money with way too terrible looking a white paper. But it basically sounds like take Docker container, run on miner's computer, profit. And I think there's probably gonna be some security concerns in that space. So it could be fun to look at. Um, takeaways from this talk. So originally I thought I was gonna go down this really deep kind of technical way and talk about all these things you should do and why you should care. But when I started reading this slide, uh, writing the slide, I found that the things that I wanted to put here were more kind of cultural or attitudinal. So the first one is just be curious. Like if you see a project out there or some new tool, like play around with it and see what it can do and how you can use it to disrupt the work you do day to day. So yeah, I guess don't get stuck in that this is how we do it because this is how we've always done it. If there's a better way, like let's do that instead. And finally, if you do play around and learn something, like share it, get out there, speak about it, send pull requests, do the open source thing, write a tool and put it on the internet. Like, Let's just get all of that stuff that's trapped in our heads and kind of behind closed doors and bring the whole industry up together. And finally, I just wanted to leave you with this quote that I quite like about thinking different. So I believe that it's the crazy ones and the misfits, the rebels, the ones who just kind of don't believe in that status quo that kind of get out there and shake things up, rock the boat and really cause things to be changed. So be one of those people. And we've got some time left, so if anyone's got any questions. Or not. Thanks. <laughs>